This video is brought to you by IVAC, the world's finest automated dust control systems. Welcome back to Home Improvement Woodworking. Today I'm going to share with you some dust collection fundamentals. I'm going to show you some tools and share with you why this is such an important health topic for anyone exposed to wood dust. Our videos show you how to add value and character to your home. This is the centerpiece of the room, so it really needs to visually work. Learn how to get quality results that you'll be proud of. Welcome to Home Improvement Woodworking. Before I dive into some tools and showing you the workshop, what I want to do is talk about the health impacts and risks of wood dust. Back in the mid-90s, wood dust was classified as a human carcinogen for the first time, meaning it can cause cancer. If we look at the U.S. Department of Labor's website, they state that wood dust can cause dermatitis, cancer, allergic respiratory effects, asthma, hypersensitivity, pneumonia, bronchitis. This sounds like a pharmaceutical ad. But wood dust is important to understand, and it's important to protect your body from. I recently had a health scare where my lungs were rated at a capacity of only 80%. I was sent to the hospital with a requisition that stated woodworker with mild obstruction. I know two woodworkers with permanent lung issues, and let me explain why that is. I'm going to draw this out for you, and we'll take a look. Here's my crude sketch of a muscular dude. What we've got here is airways of, we've got the sinuses, and we've got the mouth, and these lead into the airways. The airways then come down into lungs. So we've got two lungs, and what happens is there's natural filtration in the body. So in your nose, you can get dust here, blow your nose, you see the result of that. As the air comes down here, there's also protection here, and there's mucus lining in these areas coming in here and this is also where dust can get caught and you end up coughing that out. When the dust particles come down in here depending on the size of the dust particle if it's tiny enough your lung could actually absorb it if it's also organic so wood dust is. If it gets in the lung and it's too large to be absorbed the lung protects itself by putting scar tissue around that and scar tissue doesn't allow the lung to operate at full capacity. So over time, as you get more and more scar tissue build up in your lungs, you end up with reduced lung capacity. That's where we've got the issue, and that's what we want to protect ourselves from. So if we put an extra mechanical filter at the front here, that protects the airways from all this potential damage in the lungs. To protect your lungs, you can't wear just a dust mask. You need a respirator. And the reason is that wood dust particles are much finer than other dust particles. If you looked at the size of a human hair, it's measured at about 100 microns. The dust that does damage in lungs is 10 microns and less. So it's very, very fine. It's so fine that you can't actually see it. So what you need is a respirator. A respirator with P100 filters that filter out that fine particulate. The other important part is too, making sure that you have a tight seal on your face. I recently found out through my health scare that I've got a little bit of air leakage happening because I've got a short beard. So I'm looking at a full face respirator to replace the two that I've got today. There are woodworking regulations around the world to help protect the health and safety of woodworkers. If we look at those, the focus of them are really on capturing the dust at the source to prevent the dust from getting into the air. So I'm going to walk you through both using a shop vacuum and a dust collector how to extract that dust to prevent it from getting in the air. Now they're not always perfect. You do end up getting some dust on other surfaces. You also need to clean that up so that as you're moving around, you're not disturbing that dust and putting it into the air. So vacuum and don't sweep. Now in a shop vacuum, it's just a matter of taking your hose, connecting it up with your tools like a sander, and then you've got dust collection. Now this is a really good example of generating fine dust and sucking up the dust. But if you don't have the right vacuum filter, then you're gonna end up taking that really fine dust and just spewing it out the back and creating even more of a problem. So filtration is important. And using a HEPA filter is what you need. Now if we look inside here, this is what a HEPA filter looks like. It needs to be branded as a HEPA filter and make sure you got the right filtration. Now, when you add one of these to a vacuum, what's gonna happen is because the filter's so fine, it's gonna get clogged up in a hurry. So what you might also want to consider is a vacuum bag. This captures most of the dust, and then the fine dust gets filtered through here before the air exits the back. 
And just to show you how well a HEPA filter works, look at the dust in here. When I open this up, look how clean that is. There's nothing there. So a HEPA filter won't only protect your lungs, it'll also protect your machine. So that fine dust isn't getting put through the motor. I've burned out a few vacuum motors, not using the right filter on a vacuum. This is an example of a vacuum I used for drywalling, and drywall dust is very fine as well. Using a vacuum bag also makes easy cleanup. It's just a matter of pulling it out. A little tip for you though, use tape on the end of the opening, and that way as you're moving the bag around, your dust isn't escaping. Not all my tools have dust collection ports, and this is an example of one. I've added a port on here, there was a just ejection chute here, and this is just a piece of a vacuum attachment. And I've used construction adhesive and a screw on that dust ejection chute to add some dust collection. Now there's still dust that comes out here, but this certainly is catching a lot when I use it. For my old bandsaw, I didn't have a dust port. So what I ended up doing was under here, taking a vacuum accessory and putting it on either side of the blade and then hooking up the shop vac. And so what that does is the dust is captured right at the blade when the cut's made. Here's another example of a tool that has a dust port. This is a disc sander and belt sander and it helps manage the dust when you're using the tool. But what do you do with the larger tools? Well for larger tools you need more airflow and to get more airflow you need a larger vacuum and that's what a dust collector is for. Miter saws are notoriously dusty tools. That's why about 15 years ago, I built this dust collection hood to help me manage the dust in my workshop. This is based on airflow principles of air moves where there's the least amount of resistance. What happens here is the air gets pulled out from the dust collector and is managed through this opening. The smaller I make this opening, the more suction I have. I've got a separate video on this, you can watch the details, but I'll give you an example of how well this works. With the dust collector running, I sprinkle some loose dust I had around the shop. And you can see here, all that light stuff is being pulled right into the box. That's what I'm looking for. Now, if I open up the opening wider, so I don't have as much suction, you can see the difference here. A lot of the dust will end up falling straight down and not getting pulled in. So it's important that you've got a small opening, as small as possible, to get the most suction you can. dust collection hood is also where I keep some milestones. This was the United States Skill Olympics. I represented Canada in the cabinet making competition in high school. Let's follow this duct up to the ceiling, across, and down to the dust collector to see more about that. At the dust collector here I've got several different runs. The first one here goes to the table saw base. This one here goes to the miter saw on the other side of the room. This is a new wide joint I've just put in. I'm trying to put in dust collection at the lathe. It's a really tricky task. If you've got any tips on that, let me know. As I've got several different runs, it's important to shut off the ones that you don't need so you've got the optimal suction at where you need it. Here is an example of a blast gate. When you open it up, it opens up the opening to allow the airflow through. So when you close it, again, it does the opposite. Now when you're using these, it's best not to mount them this way because you get dust in that groove that will prevent it from closing. It's best if you mount them sideways and that way you won't end up getting that dust caught in there. This is a newer one and this is a threaded end and I really recommend going with this versus the traditional ones which require this type of band clamp on it. These end up getting loose but once you screw this on the end of the flexible duct uh, there's no way that that's coming off, so these are really good. Now you don't always need a dedicated run for a tool. For example, on my rotor table here, I've got a flange that allows me to take my table saw run and move it over for when I'm using the rotor. Now what allows this to happen is I've got something called a quick connect. This size goes on the flanges, so it just plugs in, and this size threads on the hose. So I really recommend these. 
and it just allows you to plug and play these various components. A few more considerations when you're putting these runs together that are using flexible duct, what you need to do is ground them. I have heard controversy of whether you need to ground these or not, but the theory is static builds up in here, you've got a bunch of dust moving, they hit the impeller, you get a spark from a piece of metal going through, and it causes an explosion. I don't know whether it's true or not, but I don't want to be the one to find out, so I ground these. Another is uh, using spiral duct. Metal duct is more efficient than using flexible. So where you can use these, I've got this uh, going around the room, and these are more expensive than traditional HVAC ducts, uh, something you use for heating and cooling, um, but those would collapse under pressure. So this is the product that you need for that. The other is uh, when you transition and you have a corner, not to use a 90 degree corner that would abruptly change the flow of the air, you need a gentle curve to make sure that whatever particles are suspended in that airflow don't change abruptly because that's when they will drop suspension. So make sure you've got nice gentle curves. The switch for my dust collector is way back down under here, so it used to be a real hassle to try and turn this on. So I ended up getting an IVAC switch, and this is a remote controlled switch that allows me to turn on and turn off the dust collector. I was really happy to find this IVAC switch. It works on a 20 amp circuit for mine, but they've got them for 110 and 220. They've also got an auto setting, and they've got devices that can hook up to your tools, so when you turn on your table saw, the switch automatically turns on your dust collector. They've got automated blast gates as well. Check out their products. I'll leave you a link in the description. You may have noticed that my table saw looks a little bit odd. This is a contractor style table saw I bought in 98. And it just had an open chute at the bottom to let the dust hit the floor. Not good for dust collection. So I closed in the sides, closed in the back, and put on a flange to allow the dust collector to hook up. The problem with this style of saw is the motor hangs out the back. And as I bevel the saw blade, this moves around. So I put a plate on the back here that allows some movement and I've used tape where I can close off those spots temporarily when I'm not doing any bevel cuts. Underneath the surface of the rotor table, I built in a box and this allows me to control the dust underneath by opening the box, getting access to the rotor and then closing it up to allow the maximum amount of air to be pulled down through the table. Just like I mentioned with the shop vacuum, you need to make sure the dust collector is collecting that small particle dust. I've got a one micron bag here, and that's preventing any of that dangerous dust from getting into the room. I mentioned earlier that I had my lungs tested and I had an 80% capacity. Well, when I went through the further testing in the hospital, I had some testing in a pressure chamber, I had some asthma testing. It turns out my lungs are operating at 88%. And for my height, weight, and age, that's on par with where it should be. It was a week of guessing what was going on, but it really made me reconsider and rethink all the stuff that I've learned about dust collection and how important it really is. Above my dust collector, I've got an air cleaner, and I bought this in the late 90s when I set up my first workshop. This workshop is about 200 square feet, and this air cleaner can exchange the volume of air six times in one hour. The reason that's important is because when you're cutting wood and you've got fine particulate, something that's under 20 microns, that dust can stay in the air for about 30 minutes. So having an air cleaner is another defense on protecting your lungs. If you only remember one thing from this video, I want it to be to wear a respirator and not a dust mask when you're woodworking. This is a really important message for all woodworkers. Please share this video with as many people as you can. I'll leave you with a few links to some additional videos. If you click over here when you subscribe and click on the bell icon, you'll get notified every time we release a video. Until next time, enjoy your time in the workshop. Mm -hmm.